everybody. So we're the Hallmarkies Podcast, and we are here to talk all about The Good Witch, the latest episode. And I'm Rachel. Amber is here. Hi, everybody. Episode of this season. And uh, it was a, a pretty, had a lot going on, I think. And it was a lot of fun. Um, what did you think of this episode overall? Um, it was pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't like it as much as last week's. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, you know. Decent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll be fun to talk about. So, all right. So it starts out with all the girls at the bistro and this was a a somewhat Stephanie themed episode, a big big Abigail episode. And uh, anyway, they're all at the bistro. Abigail suggests they order the asparagus omelet and uh, we kind of figure out in a little bit why that's one of the main plot lines of this uh, episode is that Abigail is trying to create all these situations where Stephanie can meet her various exes. (laughs) And uh, it starts out, there's of course we don't know that at the beginning, but she wants them to order a a asparagus omelet because she knows that her, her ex, who was an attorney, likes, I guess, asparagus omelets and will come in and will ask Stephanie out on a date um, or hopefully ask uh, Stephanie out on a date. And, uh, and then she does it two other times throughout the course of this episode. And uh, Stephanie, later on, she's like very offended by this, very irritated. Um, do you think that she's right to be irritated or how did you take this whole situ- this whole plot line? Well, it's not like she literally forced the guys to do anything. Like she, Abigail, Abigail, she just put Stephanie in situations where Stephanie was able to say, oh yeah, great. I want to date one of these guys or just blow them off. Yeah. I mean, well, she didn't even like actually line them up on a date or tell the boys to even ask her out. She just created a situation, so I feel like it's fine. Like, yeah, like, I wish I had Abigail in my life. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> because the guys weren't forced to ask her out. They just, she just put them, she just put them in a situation where she thought they would, uh, where they would uh, happen to meet, or there was more likely to meeting. And, uh, I mean, I guess Stephanie's kind of offended that, like, I don't know, maybe kind of having... Uh, Abigail's old, you know, old boyfriends or something like that, or that Abigail's being, being meddlesome. But I, I, I would, I thought it was fine. I was like, that would be great <laughs> for, for, in my opinion. So I, I didn't understand what the big deal was because uh, she also tries to put a firefighter in sort of the vicinity of Stephanie uh, at one point, and then also a tennis pro. <laughs> I mean, especially if these like are handsome, really like good guys, you know, it's not like, it's not like she's, you know, they're like jerks or, or you know, whatever. Yeah. I mean, podcast Twitter, um, I was live tweeting yeah. and I said like, so she literally goes out with the worst choice. Like she finally says yes to the tennis pro and in the hierarchy of Hallmark hunks, like tennis pro is definitely lower than attorney and attorney is definitely lower than firefighter. Right. Yeah. So why she decided to cut her teeth on tennis pro, I'll never know. <laughs> All right. Agreed. <laughs> A question for you. Yeah. Do you think that firefighter is higher or lower um, than a hometown handyman? Hmm. I mean, we've certainly seen way more hometown handymans. So it's, it's we got more of a, a pool. But, uh, um, but I don't know. It's hard to beat a firefighter. It's hard to decide, like, which one is higher up on the Hallmark hunk hierarchy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I would think, I mean, because you got, what? So let's think of the firemen we have. You've got Nine Lives of Christmas. You've got uh, in... Um, uh, in in um, Christmas in Angel Falls, he's kind of both. Oh, Green, can he? Is there? He's also country doctor, which is one of the uh, yeah you know, high level professions. That is true. 
Yeah. So what can Paul Green not do? <laughs> the answer is nothing. He can do everything. He he he, he man, he's rising up the ranks of the King of Hallmark. I, I mean, mean, he is so high up in the ranks of King of Hallmark. They gave him a Christmas interstitial. That's true. Yeah, they haven't even done that for Andrew Walker. Yeah, it's like Danica, <laughs> CCB, Lacey Chabert, Paul Green, Kelly Martin, <laughs> like. Where'd this guy come from? And yeah. then, of course, the Pena Vegas. Yeah. The firefighter is in um, For the Love of Grace, Mark Consuelos. Taste of Romance, also firefighter. Mm, yes. <laughs> so that was one of the plot lines. And I thought Stephanie was being a real dummy because I would love for somebody to like, I mean, flat out, I'm totally open to people setting me up. Like, I have no problem with that at all. Like, don't just be lazy about it and be like, oh, you're single. She's single. There you go. But like, if you actually think I might have something in common, I'm totally okay with it. No problem. Uh, <laughs> like, I know other single people are all like annoyed by it. Like, but not me. I'd be more than and, happy. And like, what does it hurt? Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I, I feel like, her and Abigail have become friends. I mean, she's going to meet her for drinks, you know, and, and, and that thing, like, there, I guess maybe the animosity still is, still is there because she was, the idea of having a boyfriend that was Abigail's ex is just too much for her. So, but anyway, so. I mean, that, I mean, whatever, that's fine. Don't, don't date your friend's exes. That's like a rule. I accept that. Obviously, Steph, Abigail's fine with it and like, Abigail dates a lot, so it might be hard in that small town to find someone she didn't date. But, like, well, I, don't, also, I just like, don't have, I don't see any reason why it's a problem. Because she didn't even set them up or line them up. Yeah. She just well, created just, situations. That's like you getting mad at me if I invite you over to a party and there is, like, one guy that I hope you will like. And yeah. then you two hit it off. Like, how dare I? forget right. it forget you well, i mean and i can understand if she's still grieving the loss of ben because he's ben we're all grieving <laughs> i mean yeah. but and so she doesn't want to move on but nobody literally forced her to move on they encouraged her and presented opportunities yeah. but nobody made her also like there's a difference between uh dating someone and like going on a couple dates with someone like girl not for me uh if, if i go on two dates with someone you better believe we're getting engaged <laughs> but like i can understand it being awkward if like i don't know like if somebody had dated if abigail had dated somebody for like two years and it was then and then stuff she was gonna set her up with this guy yeah. that would be awkward but if like they've been on like two dates not as awkward especially since uh, I believe these are supposed to be the same guys that Abigail was trying to date all at the same time in the Good Witch, um, the, the movie, the, what was it called? The, the Secret of Grey House. The Secret of Grey House. Yeah, that was a good find there. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I think it, it's, it's an interesting thing. And um, I guess, I mean, Stephanie and Abigail are really, really different. And so... Uh, maybe that might give you cause for concern, but if the relationships didn't work out, then <laughs> like, well, they weren't good for Stephanie and we're really different. So I don't know. I wouldn't overthink it. Like, I think especially when you're getting out of a relationship, probably the best thing you can do is just go on some dates. Like you're not marrying the person. You're just going on a date. You, you could marry the person. Yeah. It could happen. Sure. Sure. But it's just a date. It's not, not a, a lifelong commitment uh, just to go to dinner with someone. We have Martha, uh, through this episode, worrying about this speech. Because her husband was the mayor at the, in the beginning movies. Her husband, Tom. And he gave such a memorable speech that people are still talking about it to this day. And she is asked to rededicate this bridge that he had given this amazing speech on to. Uh, when it was originally dedicated. And so this is causing her a lot of anxiety. And what he said at the dedication, when I was younger, I used to think that bridges were built for going away. But now I know that what they are really meant for is coming home. So this was the very memorable line. Uh, and um, 
yeah, <laughs> what do you think of, what did you think about this whole plot line of Martha having anxiety about the bridge speech? It's such a Martha thing. Yeah. Um, she's so incredible. Um, I think it, I don't know. It's just a Martha thing to, to really care about what people want to hear um, and to want to get the praise, but to secretly have it all within her and the whole time. Yeah. Um, it's just such a Martha move. And, you know, Catherine Disher is just so incredible. She plays off that anxiety so well. And it's just so amazing how they're able to have her be so neurotic and so like, controlling and bombastic and yet she just has so much heart i mean did you didn't you just kind of want to cry from happiness when she was talking to tom at the end it was so good and uh and yeah because she realizes or he tells her that uh he got that inspiration of those words from her that she had said that when they were crossing the bridge one day and she's like i i never thought i was that eloquent and uh, he was like, yeah, it was you. And, and Tom's like the best, like the, the nicest man ever. <laughs> yeah, their relationship is so cute and I love them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's kind of maybe a little bit kind of like um, Rosemary and Lee. Would you agree? A little bit? Yeah, a little Rosemary and Lee. Um, I think, however, Martha is way more insecure than Rosemary. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, I love Martha so much, but definitely in their relationship dynamics, um, very similar. Yeah. Yeah. I find that I often in just observing couples, obviously I'm, I'm not married, so I can't say from my own experience, but I think it's really difficult when you have two really strong personalities in a marriage <laughs> and mm-hmm. then just like battling it out, battling it out. But I think when you have one person who is, and certainly this can be toxic and bad, but, but in general, I think it's good when you have one person who's really dynamic and really like, you know, sort of energetic and you have one person who's more of the calming, uh, presence (laughs) in the Mm -hmm. couple, uh, that uh, I've seen that. That's certainly the way my parents are. My dad is the one with the big energy, the big uh, ideas, the, you know, he's an entrepreneur, he is, uh, always kind of excited about like if my dad um, has a like a food product or something that he really likes he will literally call like all of his friends and be like this is so great or or whatever it might be and he gets very excited my mom's just more sort of the calming the calming influence of the home you know she's the nurturer she's mm-hmm. good. and um, I don't know I feel like that, that that's a really good dynamic in, in a couple you don't want to have two people that are just like that they'll both be just walked over all the time. Uh, And you don't want to have two people that are just going to be at each other's throats all the time. Uh, So it it works out quite well, I think. Yeah, I see that for sure. But it's not like Lee or Tom are like pushovers who just give in. Um, They're also strong, but in like a quiet way. So it just really works out great. And I just love it. Like a calming energy than like a, you know, walk walk all over them kind of energy yeah yeah sure. and my mom and i we uh we watch it together the show um and she just thinks it's hilarious that martha never buys anything from cassie's shop yeah. she's just there constantly and she never actually buys anything yeah yeah the the salt one was especially brazen it was hilarious <laughs> emily and salt because she's just like well this whole trip down here was worthless so i'm taking <laughs> this salt <laughs> It's so funny. And like she, it's so funny too, because she was like, are you my inspiration to whatever that was? She yeah. just kills me. Catherine Disher is a gem. <laughs> and the scene with Sam was so funny. I was dying that when she's just like, I'm going to have the congressman speak or whatever. And I thought a man of your stature, the doctor or whatever in town. And he's like, well, that wouldn't give you very much time. And she's like, I know. <laughs> Uh, that was a really fun. The next plot line that we also had is uh, with Nick and Grace. And Grace is like amazingly helpful. I don't know a teenager in the world that when their, their mom's like, hey, would you organize this closet? Like they wouldn't have like 
any pushback on that. They wouldn't be like, no, mom, I don't want to do that. You know, at least uh, most of the teenagers I know would be like, what are you, are you going to pay me? Or like, is this part of my chores? Or, you know, like, Mm -hmm. she's just like, sure, (laughs) I'll do that. I'm like, wow. Yeah. Grace really is just so thoughtful. And I think it's, you know, being raised by Kathy, who, not Kathy, (laughs) Obviously, I meant Cassie. Being raised by Cassie, um, who is, you know, super thoughtful and caring and is always trying to do these things for other people. Yeah. Um, So, I mean, that's just the environment she's raised in. But I also kind of think um, losing her dad has made her, you know, really appreciate family and spending time with her mom and, you know, all that, all that stuff. So I can totally buy her being kind of like a sort of perfect child Mm -hmm. because it helped her grow faster. I mean, it forced her to grow up a little bit, Mm -hmm. but also, um, you know, helped her to appreciate spending time at home. We go and, uh, and organize this, uh, game closet and, uh, everything's just super easy in the organizing for Grace and Nick is like, sometimes I think you're magic, uh, basically. And the way she's able to find the puzzle pieces and everything like that. And uh, I don't know, I thought that was uh, an interesting kind of moment. You usually don't have that in here. The character's kind of calling the Mary Wicks out on their magic. Yeah, um, you don't. But she also was like, no, I don't really have magic. I just study. Yeah. And I mean, she. Do- I don't really feel like they have magic. I mean, the only really magic thing we've ever seen Cassie do, magic, not like, ooh, I'm super intuitive, is, like, be really good with locks, uh, which I don't really think counts as magic. She doesn't even alohomora them. They just open when she uses them. Mm -hmm. And then also the dog thing from the first movie, which has never happened anything like it again. Later in the episode where she says, uh, looks like I've Mary wicked things up a little bit. And that's when Cassie tells her uh, that doing the actual converse, having the actual conversations and the tough talks is actually harder than relying on the intuitive charm. Uh, I says it's the easier way than doing the real work, Mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting that she said that. Um, But I don't know. It just felt like that was a unique moment, but Nick was a real pill in this episode. (laughs) Okay. I just need, I need somebody who is team Nick in this argument to present this argument to me. And like, I don't know if there's anyone that exists. So like, maybe I need to ask like rice Matthew bond (laughs) on Twitter or something because I just cannot get behind his argument. Like, yeah, that's what I would have said if you had given me more time um, when they see Courtney and he's like, I'm mm, sorry, I don't, you know, just didn't want to get serious. So I thought we should break up. First of all, that's a lie. That is not why he wanted to break up. Not like, oh, I thought we were getting too serious. So I thought we should break up. He's lying. He, he just said something nice and good, which great job. But also that's not why you broke up. You just broke up because you didn't want to date her anymore. Mm. It is what happened. It's high school. They're not, I mean, People don't expect relationships in high school to last forever. I mean. Yeah. My high school is an anomaly because like over half of my high school is married to the other half of my high school. (laughs) So like, don't, don't judge yourself by my high school. (laughs) Well, I just say my best friend is, is still married to my best friend from high school is, uh, because Amber's obviously my best friend, but uh, my best friend from high school is, uh, is. Uh, married still to her high school sweetheart. Yeah, like we're not saying it doesn't happen, <laughs> but it clearly didn't happen in this situation. And yeah. that's fine. I, it's fine. Yeah. But N- Nick is being so frustrating. And the thing that's super frustrating to me about this is that Cassie seems to be sort of team Nick in this, saying like, oh yeah, Grace was too pushy or something. And I'm like, no, she wasn't. Yeah. I'm honestly, if somebody, because Courtney was Grace's friend. She is duty bound to be like, uh, hey, other friend, I also have an allegiance to you. It's yeah. not like she can't be like, oh, well, also Nick's my better friend. So I'm just going to let him mess with my friend. Like they are on equal levels. Yeah. A friend. And she didn't even tell her. 
Like, have, have they retconned in their minds that Grace went to Courtney and was like, Courtney, Nick is breaking up with you. Because that's not what happened. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I just watched the episode <laughs> two weeks ago. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, but yeah, because Cassie gave the book to Courtney that to read to the kids in the hospital and then said to Nick and Grace to take the toys to the hospital so that they would meet. And I don't know, like what, I guess she was hoping that they would like all meet together and work it all out, I guess. Well, I mean, I kind of feel like the point of that was for Nick to have a chance to actually talk to Courtney because it seems like he's just been straight up avoiding Courtney and Courtney's been avoiding him since the breakup which happens it's fine but she's just wanting them to get past it and after nick said those things and courtney was like cool nick shouldn't be like and that's why i'm better than you yeah it was ridiculous i just can't handle nick and he was whole thing is just very very like spoiled rotten teenager ish of him he needs to grow up I I can't agree more. Yeah. Last sort of plot line of this episode is you had uh, them finding this music uh, in the piano bench uh, that uh, uh, that I, I was confused about Abigail's involvement with this music. Like she seemed to be involved somehow, but was she, was did she uh, did she tell them to get the piano or something, or did I miss something? No, I don't think like she was scheming and with, I don't know. There seemed to be, I was confused about her. Well, I think Abigail was just like, oh, listen to that music. And Sam's like super romantic about it. (laughs) And then also being like, uh, Cassie's not being super romantic about it. I'll be nosy. Yeah. I don't think she had anything to do with the discovery of the music. Okay. I wasn't sure if I, if I missed something at the beginning, but, uh, but yeah, so there's this song, this guy, Jacob Haywood, who had written, he was like the, uh, another Irving Berlin or something. And, uh, uh, from the 1930s and this handwritten song and, uh, our piece of music and, uh, James Denton can evidently do everything because he can play the piano and he played the piano and it was a really pretty song. It kind of reminded me of, um, if I had words from Babe, I don't know if you know that at all, but uh, uh, if I had words to make a day for you, <laughs> which I love, and it kind of had a, I felt a similar kind of uh, beat to it, I guess, and mm-hmm. uh, it was it was nice. What do you think of the song? Did you like the song? It was the fine. Melody? Yeah, like I wasn't like, man, somebody put this on a single and I'll buy it. Like it was just fine. Okay. Um, anyway, and so, yeah, so Sam decides to, it's kind of a, a theme of this music, and uh, Cassie really loves the music, and uh, and there, there, this kind of the, the building of Sam and Cassie's relationship. There's a funny scene where Grace sees them kissing, and she's like, is this how it's going to, what it's going to be like now that you're engaged? <laughs> that was funny. Uh, and they're like, yep, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and, uh, so yeah. And, uh, the, um, the, this, the music keeps playing throughout town. Uh, there's, they hear it in the, um, uh, in the town square, but a saxophone player, um, is playing it. And, uh, then Abigail's humming it at the store when Sam goes in to buy a rose for Cassie and uh and he ends up getting a dozen there for for Cassie and uh we also got a brief uh, scene with Tara yeah Tara welcome back where's your husband I miss him <laughs> yeah because her sort of role in this was to be working at the store and be rearranging stuff in weird ways. Yeah, which I think the whole point of that was to show us that even though Cassie is super easygoing, she does have preferences of how things are done. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, and that's kind of the point of this episode, I guess, is that because Sam is like, oh, great, 
we're in love, we're getting married. Let's kind of plan things now and Mm -hmm. like force the planning. And Cassie's like, let's not. Um, But she wasn't really saying that or asserting herself. So I think that was like the symbol of Tara rearranging things. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I, and there were some fun lines. I liked when Abigail says, I may have to start calling you Mr. Romance. And he, he says, I'm actually a doctor. I'm not going to call you, start calling you Dr. Romance. And he's like, no, that would be creepy. Except for, sorry, Dr. Romance. That's your new name, according to life. So it was a bad move. <laughs> that was funny. And then, uh, yeah, and then they're playing at this um, place where they all go to eat they're playing uh, the, this, the song again. And uh, yeah, Sam says, why don't we have this, this jazz quartet play at the wedding? Um, and then he's like, what kind of food should we have? Uh, having all these conversations. And uh, after Cassie tells, it tells Grace that you know that it's e- the easier way than doing the real work. She realizes that that that's kind of what she's been doing. Mm-hmm. So she needs to have the real conversation. And so they have this lovely moment where, first of all, she tells, she does tell uh, George that she doesn't want the baseboard painted in the house, which is kind of a, a funny scene. And uh, so she's just asserting herself all over the place. But also she has this, they have this really lovely moment between the two of them uh, where she just basically explains like, I am so excited to get married to you but you haven't asked me what I want and I haven't told you. Mm-hmm. And that was such like a great, uh, great thing. Like talk about the complete hundred percent contrast to Nick because here she is taking responsibility for her part in the communication, which is so mature uh, to do and saying, I haven't told you, you haven't asked. Uh, and um, you know, not being a, like a whiny, uh, you know, woman, like, why didn't you know what I wanted without yeah. me telling you? <laughs> um, and the thing that I like about that is like, oftentimes people haven't asked you what you want and, and you're like, oh, I didn't get what I wanted, but they didn't ask me. And you could blame someone else for that. But ultimately still, like she says, and I haven't told you, which is just as important as someone asking you what they want. If someone doesn't ask you what you want, you still have just as much opportunity as they had to ask you yeah. to tell them. And I think a lot of women want men to just like, like know what they want for whatever, for their wedding. And or their spoiler party, alert, whatever. they are not Merriwick women. They don't just have that intuition. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it would be interesting if they ever had a, a, a man on the go, you had the intuitive charm. I, we, I don't think we've ever seen that, but, but Yeah. Um, exactly. Like men aren't fortune tellers. They can't read minds and they sometimes need help. Sometimes a lot of help. My dad is the worst. (laughs) One year, my mom is, (laughs) my mom is lactose intolerant and can't have uh, grain, gluten-free, whatever. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) one year, and my dad's favorite food in the whole world is cheesecake. And one year for her birthday or Mother's Day or something, my dad got my mom a cheesecake cookbook. <laughs> which was so That's funny. so funny. Like, he literally can't eat any part of this at all. It was pretty funny. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so <laughs> they need help sometimes. Well, I mean, to be fair, everyone needs help sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And if you are not being asked what you want, tell them yeah uh i think i might tell people too much which is the problem (laughs) and like also if there's things that i want and uh, no one's asked me and i don't feel like telling people i'll just go and do it and get it for myself yeah although i am i must say i'm a pretty good present giver i I, i'm pretty good at listening for um i have some butterfly clips (laughs) that agree with that yeah yeah uh but (laughs) Okay, so yeah, and I do, it was very cute when she says, I want to be able to walk past a field of flowers and uh, and say, that's the exact color I want, or stumble upon a hidden beach and decide this is where we should say our vows. The only thing about this is this could take a long time to plan, <laughs> and I am the type of person who's like, okay, 
let's sit down, let's write it out, let's get it done. Like even sometimes with the podcast, I'm like, I have two, three days to edit it. And I'm like, gotta get it done. And I, uh, I don't know why I just, whenever I have like a project like hanging over me, it really is hard for me to just kind of like back, I'm going to put it on the back burner and I'm going to, you know, do something else. You know, it just like eats at my brain. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I don't know. so that's the only, this, this is a lovely thought, but at a certain point you got to like put pen to paper and you got to plan it. Like, yeah. I mean, the only person who could really do this would be Cassie because yeah. I feel like she will, Oh, walk past to fill the flowers in one week and then walk past this thing in one week. And then, Oh, this dress will be misdirected to her, someone else's house in the neighborhood and they'll bring it to her and it'll be perfect. Yeah. Like, it's true. It will come together for Cassie. And I don't know. Do you think it'll come together for Cassie for a wedding this year? Or do you think it'll be next season? Or do you think it could possibly be the Halloween special movie? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I, I feel like it'll be a movie. Yeah. It seems like a, a big enough moment. And her other wedding was a movie. Well, that's because it was pre-show. All of everything yeah, pre-show was a movie. True, of course. Of course. Um, but it seems like if one would, like, it still seems like if one wedding was a movie, the other wedding should be a movie to me. Yeah. You know. But, um. I mean, and there is nothing that says that Hallmark couldn't just order a movie wedding special separate from the Spellbound movie, like, from the Halloween movie. Right, yeah. That's... They can do whatever they want. They are the bosses. <laughs> do you um, here's the thing. This is what's leaning me towards this season. They establish that Abigail has that romantic waterfall, right? That she owns the land around oh. that romantic waterfall. And I don't feel like they would set that up without there being some kind of payoff. And I feel like the payoff is going to be the wedding. You're a genius. Yeah, I can see that. And I, I don't feel like that's something that they would drag out through other seasons. I mean, actually, to be fair, to be fair, it could end like, with them being like, the season could end with them saying like, this is where we want to do it. But I, yeah. I, I think it's going to happen this season. Next week is called Daddy's Home and there's a reason why. Because the final scene is a knock at Grey House. Abigail is there. She answers the door and uh, she says, hi, dad. Hi, daddy or whatever. And uh, yeah. So what do you think about that? Um... Could we possibly finally see, like we asked for just in this podcast, a intuitive Merowick man? Yeah. Could be or is he just going to be like a schlub? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. They, they have a very rocky relationship. And uh, so that's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, in uh, the next, the next. Are you surprised at all that they're focusing so much on Abigail this season? No, I mean, I think they're trying to make her be less snotty pants. Oh, definitely. For sure. And I think that part of that is getting to know her better. You can't just make her be nice and people believe it. Mm -hmm. So I think they have to show us her backstory and show us, you know, her dad stuff. So I, I, I'm fine with that. Yeah, me too. I don't think it's weird. No, I just, it's just. I, you know choice <laughs> so it's interesting uh, that they did so and I really like uh, Sarah Powers in the role I think she does a good job I, I'm just really enjoying uh, aside from maybe the Nick and Gray stuff is getting a little tired aside from that I'm really enjoying the season it's very sweet it's very fun and I know some people on uh, on uh, message words and stuff felt like there's not as much magic this season um, and she isn't Cassie maybe because she's in a relationship isn't like playing matchmaker as much as she has in some seasons mm -hmm. um, with people. And so maybe that's what they're talking about because that's really the only magic that she really does is kind of, it's a kind of, there haven't been really any borders at the house. Yeah, right? it's true. So, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see uh, how they. Well, I'm sure it. Mr. Merriwick will stay. I mean, his last, her name's Pershing, so he's probably Mr. Pershing. But yeah. I'm sure that Abigail's dad will stay at Grey House. Yeah. 
but you know what I mean? Like none of that sort of matchmaking, the different couples and stuff like that. But I feel pretty confident that we will have some sort of matchmaking coming up in episode six, Match Game. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's definitely a good guess. So yeah, let's, uh, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. So uh, we'll look forward to a new episode and get to see what's going on with Abigail and her dad. That should be pretty good. And it probably will be one of the more uh, emotional episodes of the season is my guess. So that will be good. And um, so that's the only new program we have this weekend on Hallmark Channel. Uh, so time to get caught up on things. And it's also on Lifetime is the... Um, uh, Megan and Harry movie. So that's exciting. And next week on the podcast, we are going to be talking about that movie plus the two Megan Markle Hallmark movies and Amy Lynn Craig is going to join us. So we always look forward to that. And, uh, and we will talk Good Witch, of course, next week. And so lots of fun stuff uh, on the, the podcast. And we will have our interview with the director of Royally Ever After uh, on Monday, Elie Friedlander. Uh, she talked with us and it was really fun. And first director, we'll have that on Monday. So lots of fun stuff to, uh, to look forward to coming up on the podcast. And I uh, hope you enjoyed our interview with Fiona, uh, Fiona Goobleman this week on the, uh, the podcast. She was so fun. I, I really enjoyed talking with her. So it's been a really exciting week. And uh, so Amber, where can people find you? As always, I'm at Amber Brainwaves on Twitter and that's it. Great. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews on iTunes and on YouTube. Um, my friend David and I, we just posted our spring movie wrap up where we talked about 33 films that we have both the, between the two of us had seen. And it's really fun. I think you'll really enjoy it. I, I really I would love your feedback. Check it out and uh, make sure you're following the podcast on, uh, on social media uh, and all over the place, Instagram, Twitter, uh, but we're also on iTunes. We'd love if you rate and, uh, and review us and uh, on YouTube, uh, all other places that you can access podcasts. We are there. And so we really appreciate your support. Let us know what you thought about this episode on Twitter and uh, in the comment section or whatever you prefer. So thanks so much. And uh, we'll talk uh, next week. All right. Bye, Bye. everybody.